very much. Next speaker is Alex Gaunt. Um, and he will be speaking about something very exciting, uh, actually partially invented here in Cambridge, graph neural networks. Thanks very much. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I want to talk uh, a little bit about graph neural networks. And I want to give kind of just a, an overview of uh, what's been going on. Microsoft Cambridge has uh, had a lot to say uh, in graph neural networks. But I, I just want to give a very gentle talk introducing the idea of, of the graph neural network and the history behind it and give a couple of applications. So hopefully this is a nice talk to end on because it won't be too taxing. Um, so one big objective I also have is to advertise the fact that we have released very uh, efficient implementations of graph neural networks uh, on GitHub. So there's the link there. And people have already, so our, our code is in TensorFlow, but people have already started to uh, convert it to PyTorch and things or your favorite framework. So uh, if you want to try out some of the things I discussed today, there's uh, this GitHub, you should uh, get yourself over there. So what's the problem that we're interested in? Suppose you have a data set that contains many graphs. Um, and each of these graphs has some sort of label. Maybe it's a real value or a classification or something more sophisticated. Uh, and you want to design some sort of machine learning function that can take in a graph as an input and return you the label uh, uh, as the output. So to give you a concrete example, maybe you have some molecules that are naturally represented as graphs. Uh, and these molecules all have some properties. So maybe uh, an interesting property would be how likely that molecule is a drug. And you want to build a function that's able to take new molecules and tell you whether they are likely to be a drug or not. Uh, how are we going to approach this problem? Well, the, the starting point is going to be uh, recurrent neural networks. It's a good place to start. They're very successful. Uh, and recurrent neural networks basically um, operate on a very special type of graph, the chain graph. So uh, if you have some text, then it's a sequence of tokens, uh, all connected to each other by these uh, links. Uh, and we represent uh, chain graphs using uh, recurrent uh, units. We replace each node with a recurrent unit, which I'll represent with triangles. Uh, and we link them together with, uh, with arrows. Uh, and then we uh, proceed by uh, embedding each token uh, in our sequence. So uh, there's some sort of words stored in these nodes. Uh, and we embed them, and I'm going to represent the embeddings as uh, uh, an envelope to sort of invoke the, the idea of a message. Uh, and each uh, node gets these envelopes. And then we do our usual thing of just running the recurrent neural network forwards using the, uh, some sort of recurrence relation, which given a uh, current state and a new message gives us a new state. So hopefully this is all very, very familiar. Um, and really, the, the purpose of this slide was to kind of introduce uh, this uh, kind of graphical notation. Um, because what we're going to do now is we're going to go to uh, graph structured data. So uh, if we start adding edges to this chain, then we get a, a general graph. And the important thing about graphs is, uh, so you can represent them as a nice adjacency matrix here. Uh, but the, there's, there's a, a fundamental symmetry that graphs have uh, that, you know, if you can draw them uh, in, in many different ways and they all represent the same thing. You can permute the, ver the, uh, the order of the ve uh, vertices uh, and you get a different adjacency matrix. But fundamentally, uh, all of these representations on the slide represent exactly the same graph. And so any model that we construct uh, for uh, analyzing graphs has to be invariant under these uh, symmetries. So how are we going to adapt uh, the RNN to operate on graphs? So here's a graph. Um, it's provocatively shaped like a molecule, but it could be any graph. Um, and we're going to start, just as we did before, uh, by taking some features of the nodes. So maybe this node is uh, a carbon atom, and our, uh, uh, our feature vector is just, you know, is the atom a hydrogen? Is the atom a carbon? So we put a 1 in that slot. Is the atom a fluorine? Whatever. We put zeros everywhere else, right? So we can put, put some features onto the nodes, and we'll store them in the state of the nodes. So that's a, a gray envelope. Uh, and then we, will, uh, we do that for all the nodes. So they all get their features. Uh, and then we associate a neural network with every edge of a specific type. So maybe we have single bonds represented by these green uh, edges uh, and uh, double bonds represented by uh, yellow edges. But in general, you might have um, many different edge types. So like a knowledge base would have different types of relationships and so on. Uh, so that's the basic uh, idea. And then we're going to replace all of the nodes with recurrent units, these triangles. And 
the uh, message passing is going to proceed as follows. Imagine you uh, zoom in on this particular node. That node will pull all of the messages from his neighbors. And uh, as the messages are pulled, they will go through the neural networks on the edges uh, that they ha have to pass over. Uh, and all nodes uh, at time t will pull the messages from time t minus 1 from their neighbors. So all nodes are pulling simultaneously uh, from the previous time step. Uh, and once we've collected all the, all the messages, we perform a sum. Uh, and this sum is uh, invariant to the order of the, uh, uh, the neighboring messages. Right? So you can permute the uh, envelopes inside that sum, and the, the sum doesn't change. Hey. Just a clarification. Um, the neural networks, are they somehow bidirectional, or what is the, I mean, usually neural network maps from inputs to outputs, so what so, are supposed to think about the directionality of the... The neural network simply maps uh, a vector. These messages are just vectors, and it maps to, to a vector of the same size. So what happens if you send the message the other way? Is there a separate neural network, or is it the same? Uh, so the edges are all directed. Uh, and you, if you want an undirected edge, you can uh, add the, sa the same edge backwards and then share the network on, the set on, on both edges. Right. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, that was a single time step. So we just pulled messages from uh, our first order neighbors. Uh, and so you can think about that after this single time step, each node basically knows about its own information and information from nodes that are distance one away. And then we just repeat this over and over again. So after the second time step, each node about knows about its first order and second order no neighbors. And we can just keep going. Uh, and we stop after a fixed number of time steps. And that fixed number in, uh, in our particular variety of graph neural networks, that fixed number is a hyperparameter. So you decide how many steps you're going to propagate, so sort of the radius of, uh, of your uh, smushing around of information before you start. Uh, once you've finished going round and round and round, you have representations stored uh, on all the nodes that somehow have collected information from the local environment of the graph. And then you just collect them all up and perform a sum. And again, this sum is permutation invariant. So. Uh, and then you have a representation of your graph, which you can feed to whatever uh, higher layers that you want to uh, perform your action on. So that was um, a very Microsoft-centric view of what the graph neural network is. Um, and it summarizes the code that's in the, the GitHub. But uh, graph neural networks, uh, like all good ideas, uh, were invented a very, very long time ago, uh, at least in deep learning standards. Um, and uh, in this work, uh, they, 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 rather than we, we have this hyperparameter that says you, you know, you're going to unroll for a certain number of steps. In the original work, they said, we're going to just unroll forever, and we're just going to keep going until you reach a fixed point, and then we'll stop. And you can show that if you do that, you have to um, put some uh, constraints on the uh, forms of the neural networks uh, of the recurrent units. And those constraints mean that actually, even though you're doing all of this unrolling, you can only, the, the, the influence of one node on any other node exponentially decays with the distance between the nodes. And so it's actually not a very good way of uh, uh, sending, message, uh, sending information around a graph. And so uh, this was updated uh, at Microsoft Cambridge to use um, uh, gated recurrent units and, uh, or LSTMs uh, as a means of transferring longer range dis uh, information across the graph. Uh, and s sort of in parallel, uh, the, the, the story I've, I've told you has been approaching the whole idea of graphs from uh, starting from uh, recurrent neural networks. And in parallel, people were thinking uh, about convolutions on graphs. And so uh, there's, there's, it's very, you, you can perform a convolution very efficiently in Fourier space, and the Fourier transform of a graph is a well-defined uh, operation. And so uh, people uh, came up with the, the concept of convolutions on graphs, and there are a series of approximations. It, performing the Fourier transform is, is very computationally expensive, so uh, these guys just, just did the co expensive computation, and then they made a progressive uh, approximation to make it more and more uh, efficient. Uh, until finally, uh, some guy realized that they'd made so many approximations that actually uh, everything was uh, just the same thing. That these convolutions had converged on exactly the same architecture as uh, the, the graph neural networks. Um, 
and there was a great paper which was the first sort of uh, proper application of this to some serious uh, chemistry data uh, that, that was unifying all of these different <coughs> methods. <coughs> and now, um, uh, you know, the field has kind of exploded. So I've just mentioned the Microsoft-based papers here, but there are very many, many papers appearing on learning on gr using graphs uh, in, in recent conferences. So, <coughs> um, yeah, just uh, once again, flash this advert up that... Uh, all, all that I've been describing has been in this uh, blue box labeled 2. So, so that's the particular variety of model that I've been describing. So what, what can we do with this? Um, I've been mentioning chemistry every now and again. Um, and sure enough, if you put uh, these graph neural networks inside uh, some uh, other optimization algorithm and use these graph neural networks as a scoring system, then you can come up with molecules that are very, very likely to be drugs. So there's this drug likeliness scale goes from 0 to 1, and you can generate these molecules that are very, very likely to be drugs and haven't been discovered before. But you have to be careful because um, you, know, you can come up with adversarial examples that uh, the network is very confident of drugs, but actually uh, they are very bad and uh, not drugs at all. So there's a lot of work left to actually use these in, in realizing this dream of deep learning to revolutionize the, the drug industry. But uh, it is promising that we can very easily get uh, these very high-scoring molecules. And maybe uh, another example that has, uh, there'll be a, a talk about this particular example at iClear. Uh, it comes from uh, Miltos uh, Alemanis and Mark Brockschmidt. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, a program is, you can see it as a list of tokens. It's just a, a stream of tokens. And you can see the stream of tokens in gray uh, at the bottom there. So for example, uh, assert dot not null open brackets, but you can augment this stream of tokens with uh, the abstract syntax tree on top of that that stream, uh, and you can add other edges like you know connect uh, positions where vari variables were last read and, and written to, and so you can build a big graph that represents programs, and you can ask a graph neural network to solve problems on programs. So, for example, if I gave you this um, snippet of code and I asked you to fill in the blank. Um, uh, knowing that the possible type correct uh, uh, variables to put into this uh, slot are class or first, uh, then it turns out that the developer who was writing this code had written class. Um, and uh, you can see that that has come from about from a copy and paste problem. That they should really have written first, uh, but they've just copied and pasted that snippet of code. And so, uh, we want to use a graph neural network to <coughs> instead uh, look at those possible candidates, first in class, uh, work out a representation for uh, the slot variable, uh, and work out the representation for the first in class variables in that, in that graph, and find which representation best matches the slot. And the graph neural network will point out that, in this case, um, the first variable should, should be placed in the slot. And we we're able to find bugs in some uh, real uh, code repositories using this method. Uh, so just to give you some idea that you know, graph neural networks are actually better than some other baselines, uh, you can do exactly the same sort of variable misuse task using uh, an RNN to look at the surrounding context or an RNN uh, around each use of a variable, and you get worse performance. And similarly, Rather than selecting from a set of uh, type correct variables, you can use the representation of the slot to initialize an RNN, which is going to produce you a string, which is the, the, uh, a good variable name to put in that slot. And again, the, the graph neural network outperforms simple uh, natural language processing baselines. So, yeah, uh, that was kind of a whistle stop tour in 17 minutes of the. Uh, area of graph neural networks. Um, and if you want to dive in, then um, you know, get yourself over to the, the GitHub page. We have time for questions. In fact, we need to fill three minutes until the pizza is there. <laughs> hey.
So, okay. um, that was a while ago that they got to it. I wondered if you'd like to comment on kind of what these the theoretical results about graph isomorph, isomorphism say about how hard it is to do some of these tasks. Uh, so we've never actually tried using a GNN just to directly solve the graph isomorphism uh, problem. And really we've been, comp I mean, we just built in the symmetry, the permutation symmetry into the model. That was the, the priority. Um, so we haven't really thought too deeply about isomorphisms. But well, I mean, if you have two isomorphic graphs, then what, what would you hope? So I guess um, the, the result in the kernel literature says something like, if you have um, a kernel with project different graphs, different things about the graph, you computationally hard to evaluate. So I guess the question would be, you know, are there, are there limitations to these methods on that basis? Maybe there are classes of graphs where we won't be able to tell the difference between them. Um, so what, one big issue is um, that we do this, I mean, it's not related to isomorphism, but we do this truncated propagation. And so if you have uh, a cluster over here and you're propagating inside that cluster and then you have a very long, thin uh, connection to another cluster, then if our propagation doesn't go far enough along this branch, then we won't be able to tell the difference between uh, that graph and a graph with a slightly longer link or, or, or anything like that. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, it's not ideal, but no, I mean it's the first stab. Um, it seems to work very well, right? Better, right. Than, better than these other things. I think that's because natural graphs are not pathological <laughs> uh, in some sense. you do the, the sum of all the, the resulting um, messages. Uh, I kind of see that as a pooling operation. I was just wondering if other types of pooling would make sense. And if uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, we, we have a hyperparameter, sum, mean, max. Yeah, um, max is a bit unstable, but sum and mean are fine, and you can come up with your favorite, and maybe it would be better. Yeah. Are, are there probabilistic versions of these? Um, I mean, at the moment, we've done a very it's a sort of very much a clone of RNN style things. Uh, there's no there's no stochasticness inside our models at all. No. So yeah, it would be interesting to expand that. Any last question, or is everybody hungry? Can smell the pizza outside. Great. Let's thank Alex again Thanks. for a great talk.